hold them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Is shaking, all the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, We're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is great. Well, hey, everyone, so glad that you've tuned in today. And today is a really special day, 15 years. Today, CCC is passing the 15-year mark as a church, and we kind of struggle with what to call it sometimes. Is it a birthday? Is it an anniversary? So we just call it our anniversary birthery, and it's a celebration. And there's a lot to be grateful about. Lives have been changed through the power of God in the work of this church. Countless people have made life-altering decisions in one of our services. Great prayers have been uttered to God. Hearts have been given over to Him. We've seen new churches planted by people from this church. We've seen people go around the globe and share acts of kindness and compassion. We've seen close to 700 baptisms here, a food pantry that served more than 3,000 people, thousands and thousands of volunteer hours logged by people who are living beyond themselves. I mean, how great is that? Some of you have made the most important decision of your life through the ministry of this church. And it's through CCC that you decided to stake it all on Jesus, your past, your present, your future, your eternity. You've put it all in his hands. We've sung songs to God together, eaten meals together. I mean, pizza getting anyone? We watched our children grow up and nurtured by C3 kids and student ministry volunteers. There's just so much to celebrate, more than we'll ever know. And I'm personally just grateful for this church. So it's good and right for us to take this time and remember all that God has done with gratitude. So often in the Bible, God instructed his people to remember their spiritual victories. He established festivals and feasts so that his people would always remember the way that he had worked in their lives. So it's appropriate for us to pause and reflect and give thanks for the way that God has worked here. In fact, let's pause right now and give thanks to God through prayer. 
God, thank you for all of the ways that you have shown yourself here at Community Christian Church. We are grateful. And we pray that we would be sensitive to you and follow you and that we would remain as a vibrant church and that you would bless us with your presence and your power in years to come. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Now here's the deal, we're grateful. It's a day to celebrate, right? Absolutely. But it's also a day for examination. It would be so easy just to rest on our laurels. It would be easy to say, well, how great is it, all that God has done here, and then just leave it to that. And then just slip to a place where we forget or become less passionate about why CCC was started in the first place. I read one time where some sociologists who specialize in analyzing churches came up with this study that the average church reaches its peak of effectiveness by year 20 of its existence. Well, that's not far away for CCC. I mean, I'm not good at math, but we're celebrating year 15 now, and that means year 20 is going to come sometime in the next 10 years. You need to remember, I went to college to be a minister, so those math skills aren't really great. But think about that. Year 20 is the peak of effectiveness. And I want to say, that's not good enough. There's more for us to do. God has more than five years of effectiveness left for us. Our passion for God, our zeal for Him, that's got to keep growing. So we celebrate. But today also serves as a day of vigilance. We're not going to be a statistic. Our peak needs to lie way in the future. And we need to pay attention so we don't become stale. And so to that end, to challenge us to a greater calling, I want us to look at a letter that Jesus wrote to a church. Now, first you might think, Jesus wrote letters? I mean, wow, wouldn't that be so cool to get a letter from Jesus, right? Well, maybe. It depends what he'd have to say. But in the last part of the Bible, we have this interaction where Jesus dictates some letters to several churches, and the letters vary widely in tone. Some are positive, and some are really pointed, and they're stern. And so think, to get one of those more stern messages wouldn't have been too exciting. In a sense, his letters are like progress reports. You remember those? Excellent, satisfactory, very good, good, needs improvement, see you again next year. All right, that last one may have only been on mine. Well, these are spiritual progress reports. How would you like to get a progress report from Jesus that said, Man, you're doing an awesome job. That'd be great. But what if he sent one that said, pull it together, Skippy? That wouldn't be too exciting. So in the section of the Bible that we're going to look at today, Jesus addresses the church at a place called Sardis, and he gives them a bad progress report. And that ought to serve as a warning to us on this special day of celebration, that it's easy to slip into bad habits and slowly lose our passion for God that if we're not careful, we could wind up in the same place as that church in Sardis, and we don't want that. Now, as we look at this letter, you'll immediately notice that it comes from the book of Revelation. And Revelation is apocalyptic literature, which means it's got a lot of symbolism and figurative language in it. And people, for some reason, when they read Revelation, they just start coming out with all kinds of crazy ideas. But as we read this, I want you to see that this is just a letter from Jesus to a church. And Jesus dictates his ideas. He writes this way. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard and hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief and you will not know at what time that I will come to you. Now, Jesus starts out with some of that figurative language that I mentioned. Verse one begins like this. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, this is obviously symbolic language. So I want to be clear that Jesus is really beginning his message to this church with a simple reminder of who's in charge. Because in order for a church to be an effective church, they need to have figured out this question of who's in charge, who's on the throne. 
They have to figure out, is this thing we call church a human endeavor with human priorities, or is this a divine enterprise with divine priorities left for humans to manage? And how we answer that makes all the difference when it comes out to how the church is led and managed. It means that it won't be led by human reasoning, like a business or a club. It means that sometimes what we do, the decisions that we make, won't make sense, maybe from a financial point of view, not unless you get what matters most to God. I remember in the church that I led for a long time, we'd taken a loan to build a church building. And when the first term of the loan had finished, we were refinancing that, and the local bank looked at our financial statements, and they couldn't understand, why do you give away so much of your income to start new churches and to help missionaries around the globe? I mean, they just couldn't understand the idea that we would support the work of God in other places and not just be about our own stuff. Because from a local financial perspective, that doesn't make sense. But from Jesus' point of view, it makes perfect sense. Now that breaks down on a personal level for all of us. Is my life a spiritual endeavor with spiritual priorities or is it a human endeavor with human priorities? That affects things like how we interact with other people and even how we manage our money. Because our financial advisors won't understand when we regularly give away our income to the effort of helping people find their way back to God. That doesn't meet a personal financial goal. But it comes down to who's on the throne. What is your life all about? Is it all about me? Or are there things that are bigger than my own welfare? And so the whole paragraph here begins with this identification of who the leader is. Jesus says, I'm in charge here. I've got all authority. I've got all power. I control the spirit and the stars, and I want you to pay attention to what I have to say. Now, here's the takeaway from this verse, and I don't want us to miss it. Most of life is about figuring out who's in charge. The first step in making wise decisions as an individual and as a church is to recognize that the person whose opinion matters the most on any subject is the person of Jesus. All the other voices, all the other opinions can fade into the back as long as we follow him. And if we're going to remain a vibrant church long past year 15 and 20 and beyond, and if you and I are going to have a vibrant faith into our future, it will begin by knowing who's in charge. You see, your preferences, your ideas in life, my ideas, they matter, kind of. But they're always subservient to the one who made it all. And as a church corporately, we live in a prayer of, Lord, how can we honor you and serve your purposes in any situation? Now, he continues in verse 1. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Now, when I was growing up, we'd say, now that's cold. He says to them, literally, guys, you're a bunch of zombies. You're dead people charading as living people. I mean, your church looks alive, and from the outside, people have given you the reputation of you being alive, but that's just not true anymore. Now, we all know that this is possible, right? You ever visited a business and thought, oh man, these guys are not going to make it. I mean, they're open, but there's no passion about what they're doing. The employees aren't enthused. We see it around us all the time. Stores that were staples in the U.S. economy, but they're resting on yesterday's achievements. And now they're kind of dying off. And notice he says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. You've been living on reputation so long, you don't know that your current deeds don't match up to the past. Now, I want you to reflect on your faith journey just for a second. Just think about all the roads that you've walked down, all the roads you've walked with the Lord in your life. Think about your faith victories. Think about the things that God has done in your life. Now, friends, if all your great stories of faith are from a long time ago, there's something wrong with that. Because as followers of Jesus, we're called to live by faith all the way to the end of our lives. And as a church, the great stories of risk, of laying it on the line and expecting God to show up, those stories need to lie ahead, not just in our past. The apostle Peter wrote that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. The arc of the Christian life needs to exhibit faith at every step of the journey. Now that'll keep us humble and praying and connected to God, who's ultimately in charge. Here's another takeaway. God cares more about your character 
than your reputation. It's not about what other people think about you. It's about who you are, who you really are that matters. So we stay humble and faithful because character trumps reputation. You make your decisions completely differently based on whether you're aiming for character or if you're aiming for reputation. And I want to ask you, are you more concerned about your character or your reputation? About what others think or about who you really are? So Jesus warns the church. He says to them, if you're focusing on reputation and not on character, then you're on that road of deterioration. And that can happen to churches. Resting on past moments of faith and not endeavoring for God in new ways. And Jesus says to this place, if you're not careful, you'll cease to be a church. Now, the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he always points to a path of escape. And so he identifies some things that the church can do to avoid being the walking dead and instead be fully alive. And he describes it in two words. Verse two, wake up. What a great start, right? Jesus says simply, wake up. You don't want your church to die? Wake up. Snap out of it. You know, I have a great dog. My dog's name is Eddie. Eddie's my eight-year-old cockapoo, and I absolutely love him. Eddie's got a Baltimore name. He's named after Edgar Allan Poe. Eddie's short for Edgar, and and he's just this energetic eight-year-old. Now, he's been a real companion to me in some tough times in this life, and, and I just love him. But Eddie wakes me up every day somewhere around 5.30 in the morning. Now, I've never been a morning person. As a teenager, I was that kid who could sleep till noon. But he wakes me up every day in a really drastic way. He jumps up on the bed somewhere around five o'clock. I don't always detect that. And then he'll stand on my back and neck when he wants me to get up. And if his sheer weight doesn't wake me, he will lick me often right in the ear. Now, folks, nobody likes a wet willy, but you definitely don't want a wet Eddie. I mean, it's just gross. But I'll say this, Eddie's methods might be drastic, but it does the trick. When the dog wakes me up, I'm up for the day. Now, sometimes you need a drastic wake up. I remember in college as a freshman, my roommate and I had this, this plan. We had an 8 a.m. Shakespeare class my first year in school, three days a week. Now, neither one of us were morning people, so we had three alarm clocks, and we set them all five minutes apart. And so the first day we did this, my roommate got up and he turned off the first one and the second one and the third one and then went to class and I missed it. And I asked him, Dale, why didn't you get me up? I mean, wasn't that the whole point of having these alarms set? I don't want to miss class. He said, well, I said something to you before I left, but I guess you didn't hear me. Well, thanks. How about something more drastic, right? Jesus says to the church in Sardis, you're sleepwalking. You're the walking dead, and you're in danger of your faith, so wake up. You know, sometimes we just need to see the drastic nature of our situation because we're experts at minimizing our sins and our struggles. We shrug them off and we think, well, nobody's perfect. And that's true, nobody is perfect. But God takes sin seriously. He takes your calling to follow him seriously. He does not see the church as something that we use as a hobby in between our other commitments. Our faith isn't supposed to be just a part of our lives. It's to drive every section of our lives. It's the difference between driving and riding in the back seat. When you're driving, you make the call on how fast to go and how often to stop and where to turn. You've got the controls. When we put our faith in the driver's seat, it means we navigate our lives by letting our faith in Jesus do the driving. Our selfish desires go in the back seat. All our decisions get made through the lens of our faith in Christ. When we put faith in Jesus in the back seat, we take it along for the ride, but it's got no power. It can't guide us. And before long, we'll forget it's even back there and we'll do as we please. Friends, we can't sleepwalk in matters of faith. We've got to wake up to the things that matter to God. We've got to represent Jesus well because he knows more than our reputation. He knows who we really are. Now we can say that we're followers of Jesus and that may or may not mean something to other people. But when we say that we're Christians, we are saying to God that we're going to try to be, to the best of our ability, like miniature Jesuses, and that we're going to do our best to do what Jesus would do, to live how Jesus would live in whatever context in which we find ourselves. Now, what he's saying here is this. 
A faith on autopilot is no faith at all. It's coasting. And if we're not careful, we'll fall asleep while things are on cruise control. So wake up. And he goes on. Notice the remainder of verse two. He says, strengthen what remains and what is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Why is it that we can start out so well, but we can leave things undone? How are you with your home projects? Are you like me? You've got some projects that remain unfinished. I've got a light switch that I've been meaning to replace for three years. I took the light cover off. I bought all the electrical electrical parts that I need. I just need to do the job. But it requires me turning a breaker off, which always seems just so inconvenient. So it remains undone. Now, in some ways, the work of the church is always undone. We exist to help other people find their way back to God. That work is never done. We, we will hand that mission from one generation to the next. However, there are some things that shouldn't remain unfinished. The work inside of our lives, where we should be constantly growing in our faith, we should stop making the elementary mistakes of growing and maturity. That work is to find its completion in the lives of Jesus' followers. We all grow individually and corporately as Christ finishes his work in us. Our lives more and more are to reflect the nature of Jesus. We show progress and become stronger and stronger in our followership of Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul describes in Colossians chapter 1. Notice, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and the understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Jesus says to the church at Sardis, you've stopped construction on the inner life. Wake up, finish the work that Christ has begun in you, bear good fruit, grow in your endurance. I think if we're honest, we might say, many of us, that we've stopped construction on our lives with God. You used to read the Bible every day, then we stopped. Used to be at church every week, or at least tune in every week, and then we stopped. We used to volunteer, we used to be in a small group, and then we stopped. And friends, COVID sure hasn't helped. And if we're not careful, we'll get to the place where Jesus needs to write us a letter saying, wake up, strengthen what remains because things are unfinished. And the great news in this, if you need to get back into good spiritual habits, you're not on your own. God's Holy Spirit will work within you and me if we don't quench his work. Notice again from the Bible, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Here's another takeaway. God will assist you in your faithfulness. You're not on your own, but you've got to wake up and see that the work is unfinished. Now let's move on to verse three. Jesus says to this church at Sardis, remember therefore what you've received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief and you will not know what time I will come to you. Friends, matters of faith in Jesus are not just nice things to add to your life. When we talk about the church, what we talk about together, these are matters of eternity. They are life and death topics. They affect not only our here and now, but everlasting eternity. I think this is why Jesus gives such a consequence here. He says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come to you like a thief. Now, does anybody know when a thief is coming? No. Do you look forward to seeing a thief? Not at all. Do we like the consequences of having a thief cross our paths? No way. This is not a good consequence. Jesus is basically saying to the church here at Sardis, don't make me pull this car over. Don't make me come back there because you won't like it if I have to do that. No, instead, he gives us the pathway for renewal and recalibration. Remember, repent, and return. Remember what you received and heard. Remember that Jesus sacrificed everything. Remember that he's the way to God, that there is no other way. Remember that he's the giver of salvation. Remember his commission to go into all the world and teach people and baptize people and show them the way. Remember what's at stake. 
Remember your charge as a mini Christian, as a mini Jesus, and then repent. What does repent mean? Change. Change how you're thinking about things. Change your sense of urgency. Get into the no huddle offense. Change the direction of your momentum. Repent, turn around, and then return. Return to the way you did it at the beginning. Hold fast to your early faith. Remember when you first came to Christ? Remember what it felt like to experience forgiveness? Remember when you took those early steps of faith, how alive you felt, how enthusiastic you were? Remember how you invited people to church, how you shared your faith, even when you didn't understand everything? Return to that. Hold it fast. Remember, repent, return. Friends, this is why we do so much of what we do at CCC. When you see things like the 52 Challenge that encourages you to read the Bible every week, or things like Discover that are meant for you to grow in your faith, maybe take the next step. When you hear one of the teachers at church encourage you to join a small group or to volunteer to serve others, it's not to make your life more complicated or crowded. It's not the substitute teacher giving you busy assignments to keep you well-behaved. These opportunities are meant to help you to grow, to help you from having your faith in Jesus become stagnant and your spiritual life grow cold. And it takes effort and it's worth it, but we need to persevere. I'm 55 years old. I can't remember a time I didn't go to church. I can't remember a time when Jesus wasn't a part of my life. And I made a decision of faith when I was 12 to give my life completely to him and to follow him all of my days. What good would it be for me to serve the Lord all these years and then say, I think I'll coast in from here. Why be faithful for a time only to fall off? I wanna encourage you to run with me, to run hard all the way to the end, to not let our spiritual days, our best days be behind us, but to engage with enthusiasm the days to come. Now, Jesus dictated this letter to the church at Sardis, and, and I'm sure it wasn't easy for them to read. There was a time when that church was doing great, that people were living with great passion as they followed Jesus, but their vigilance waned. It waned to the point where Jesus called the people the walking dead. He said their deeds were half finished and unfinished, but in the end, he gave them hope. God is always the giver of hope. And here's the deal. We don't have to wait until things get bad to double down on our commitment. Let's give ourselves more fully for another 15 years of helping people find their way back to God. Let's have our greatest stories of faith and risk and commitment. Let's let them lie in front of us. Let's resist resting on our laurels. Let's live with passion. And know this, if you're in a place personally where it feels like you've lost your way, you know the path back. Remember, repent, turn back to the one who offers you mercy. And once you do that, you run hard all the way to the end. Let's close it out with this verse. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. We're gonna celebrate communion together. It's something we center on every time we gather like this. Grab some bread and juice so you can fully participate. We take the bread because it represents Jesus' body that he gave up for us. And we have some juice because it reminds us of his blood that was poured out on the cross. During communion, we remember that at the core of our faith, at the very heart of our relationship with God, is the sacrifice of Jesus. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, God has made a way for us to be forgiven to be made right. He's made a way for us to move forward and be made whole. I encourage you to take a few moments and think about God's incredible love for you. I'll pray and then feel free to commune with God in your own time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace, for your forgiveness. You are for each and every one of us. Help us turn our hearts towards you. Help us have soft hearts to what you want to do in our lives. Thank you for loving us and accepting us. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathe your life in me you have been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god but i was your foe still your love fought for me you have been so so me. I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god And you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up coming after me Deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Thanks for tuning in today and experiencing CCC online. Online in person, on demand. It's all about helping people find their way back to God. And if you would like to support CCC financially, you can give by texting CCC White Marsh to 77977 or click the Give tab at communitycc.net. Your continued generosity and support have impacted so many lives over the years. And as CCC turns 15 years old today, I wanted to share one of those stories with you. This is my friend, Kim. Hi, my name's Kim Perouty, and I'd like to tell you what I love about CCC. Back in 2006, I got a postcard in the mail, and it said, no perfect people allowed. And I thought, hmm, now there's a place that I would fit in. Because of the messages and the relationships with the people that I've met there, I've developed my relationship with God, and I continue to grow in my journey. And I am forever grateful. People that 
started out as acquaintances, became friends, and now I consider to be part of my family. My husband attended there before he was my husband, so that's a pretty cool thing. My 12-year-old has made friendships that have spanned the 12 years. Um, he's also had adults that have been pouring into him, um, small group leaders that aren't his small group leader anymore that are continuing to pour into him. So I'm so grateful for that community. Um, and it just feels like a place that feels like home when you're there for me. And I am grateful. Thank you, CCC. You know, there are 15 years worth of stories just like Kim's. What's yours? Would you be willing to click the share your story button at communitycc.net and tell what you love about CCC? Just a short video, 15, maybe 30 seconds. All the instructions are there. I hope you'll check that out. We also have a survey going on and your feedback is really crucial for CCC to take a snapshot of the church. You know, we do this every so often because it's incredibly helpful just to figure out the best ways to accomplish the mission, helping people find the way back to God. It only takes a minute or two of your time and it really helps CCC head in the right direction. We're gonna wrap up a little differently today. The band is gonna play a song called The Blessing and the words are taken right out of the Bible from a time when God told Moses, the leader of the God's people, the Israelites, to have the high priest Bless God's people with these words. And then God said, when you do, you'll put my name on them. How cool is that? That's what we want for all of us as we head out of this service today. This time where we've been celebrating what God's done through CCC over the last 15 years, we wanna be marked as God's people, living and experiencing his peace and mercy and compassion and protection and goodness. This song is our prayer for you, CCC. Check it out. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward
you're calling, and you're weeping, rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you.